my name is Lisa Powell, my maiden name is Lisa Bennett and my family name is the Conlins. That's on the Gubby Gubby side, the Aboriginal side of my family. Um, my father is um, a descendant of the Danish and um, their um, homelands were up at Concurry. Yeah. And they, his family was the first overland haulage with the camels and the bullock drays. And then they had the steamships that went up and around from Sydney to Darwin. And they were based at Cloncurry. And um, then my dad met my mum down here in Gympie. Um, and they married and hence we came along. <laughs> Let me start from... Let's say on my grandmother's side, on my mum's side, um, Mena and Pa, that was um, Percy and Beatrice Conlon, they were one of the first Indigenous people to be allowed from Sherbourg to move on to what they called European settlement. And to do that, they had to sign a dirty big petition or um, a piece of paper that said that they would live in a house, they would wear clothes, they would um, send their children to school and they would work hard. The um, funny thing about that was the children weren't allowed to go to school, we weren't allowed to attend church and um, yes my, both my grandparents worked very hard for um, uh, Miles MacDonald, um, the MacDonald family were, were the ones that employed my grandparents and um, they settled down when they moved to Gympie in Bath Terrace, right next to the Victory Hotel and the house they lived in was um, the original hotel out there. So it was quite a, an amazing place to go and visit Grant Nana and Pa because you had all these little nooks and crannies and big backyards and stuff. But um, Mum and Dad, when they got married, they were given a plot of land on Jones Hill and we're still there today. Um, Dad built the house. Um, so weatherboard house and that was built I was three years old when we moved in so it would have taken him about the three years to build it so around 1962 we started around 1965 we moved in and I remember still going from the old house up the paddock uh, which has been removed now um, down the down through the paddock in the ute and I was I still remember sitting on dad's lap and steering the car down not that I was um, I thought I was steering it down the down the paddock to take the furniture down to the new house so yeah we've sort of like old residents of Gympie of Jones Hill now because um, well there were there were a number of other people there um, up the road a bit further, there were the Pockleys and of course um, there were the Corbetts who now have a big industry out that way but they started off as a dairy farmer and um, Alex was, um, Alex and I can't remember her name but we always used to, you know, address them as Mr and Mrs. So. I shouldn't remember their real names. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's in the Jones Hill area where where I grew up. I remember that um, Mr. and Mrs. Radford owned the store, and it was actually the Radfords um, that gave Mum and Dad the land for their wedding present. Yeah, so um, that was quite good of them. Um, and we went up, oh, I remember the first day I started school at Jones Hill, my brother and sister, older ones, had hidden me behind the front door. And because when the teacher walked in, Mr Burns, 
And I jumped out and said, hello, I'm here. <laughs> you know? And he was quite surprised and, you know, because I was the only grade one student there. Um, eventually, by grade three, we had two other students in with me <laughs> there. Um, but, you know, it was just a funny little school with a little room where everyone learnt in the same room, you know. And I remember them little old wooden desks and the seats and... Um, I remember lining up at the front, there's still a, um, a bitumen area at the front of the old school and that's where our parade used to be and the teacher would stand on the veranda and talk to us and you know our sports days were um, a game of rounders out in, out in the yard or um, tiggy or something like that. It was wonderful there at that little school. Um, as I said earlier, um, Mum actually wrote the copy books of uh, for the Jones Hill School. Um, one, I think it was about two years in a row. Something happened with the printing of the government's printing of copy books and stuff, and um, so she um, had the most beautiful handwriting and did all the copy books. So now that all the children that went through that era write like my mother with big swirls, you know, all this, I do too. But um, it is a lovely handwriting today to look at handwriting. I teach too now. <laughs> so um, I actually teach the teachers. I write the Indigenous curriculum and, and embed it into the schools with the teachers. So um, to look at what we were told to do at that age, to what children write like today. <laughs> it's just like mm, quite a contrast. Well my other biggest fear is reading books. Children are always on those pad things and half the time they're read, being read to or to talked to so they don't have to read it. What's going to happen with these children down the track or their children? Mm. You know, Books you got to have books. We actually kept the school open because of our big family. We had five going to the school. And yeah, well, um, the situation occurred that the parents didn't care for the teacher that was the principal that had been put in place there because he was a bit of a cane person. And um, so they transferred their children over to Southside. And so that left that school with very little Thing, um, students there, probably only about 18 or something, maybe that. And then they were th talking about closing it down. And um, look at it today. It's one of the most popular schools. But we kept that open. My grandmother's picture is on the back wall. They asked us, oh, this is many years ago when um, my children were going there. We've had a couple of generations go to that school. And um, I was quite involved in the school with the planting and the frog ponds and all that sort of stuff. And then they asked if we could, they wanted the history. And so we talked about the history and they said, oh, would you like to have mum or you or somebody up there? I said, no, I prefer to have my grandmother. That's the respectful thing to do. So she was put up on the back. Not a really good painting, I'm afraid. But she was put on the back wall. And then um, from there on, but I've only just recently gone back and explained that to the new principals and teachers at that school. So they didn't know the story and they wanted to know the story. And so I, I went over and did a bit of an interview with them and explained the situation of the school there. Back to Jones Hill, there was a lot going on at Jones Hill, believe it or not. There was the dairy farm up the road. Um, over the back, uh, they call it Waldock Road now or something, but it was just called the lane um, beforehand. And up the top of the lane was Dr. Kestevan's orchard. So every time we went into Dr. Kestevan with a flu or something, he growled at us for not pinching his orchard, <laughs> pinching fruit from his orchard. So naturally, we went up and got his mandarins and his oranges and things like that. But, but he was a lovely man. They were lovely people, and you know, back then everybody sort of knew each other, and 
they were acknowledging each other, you know, and, and oh, well, if you haven't got that, I've got that, I can probably help you out, you know, and that. And that's what I find missing today is that um, with the new estate up the road at Jones Hill, where I used to roam, in the paddocks and the creeks, I don't, you know, you don't know anybody. We know our neighbours down the bottom of Jones Hill there because we've been there for some time and, you know, still in the old school of greeting and meeting and new neighbour, hello, welcome to the neighbourhood sort of thing. But up the back at Echelon, it's just become quite a separate place. My biggest worry or concern is I'm, I'm a conservationist and um, that's what part of those walks are all about is conserva conservation. And like when we were children, we'd roam up through all that area. Um, we'd even have a little song called the Cumquart Club because we'd go up the back of the Perkins's farm right up the end of Jones Hill, of um, Macintosh Road. And like there was an area up there, we built cubbies and there was Cumquart trees and whatever, and we'd pick them and we'd sing this. It was horrible because it was back in the years of the cigarette advertising and there was a cigarette called Escort, I think. And we used the tune off that. And so it was, join the club, join the club, join the kumquat club. And we'd all be marching down the road with all these kumquats and stuff. So, yeah, and, and it'd be not just us, it'd be the whole neighborhood. Like there were the Leroyds, they had six kids, we had six kids, um, the Mars, who else was there? There was uh, the Grahams, they were up further. Um, they had six, we all had heaps of kids, you know, so we all got together and they were the days when you could be free to roam. Like we'd go down to McIntosh Creek at the bottom of, of Sullivan's property there. They didn't care. We'd have our little brothers and sisters with us, like they were little, in three and four. But our parents knew that we were sensible enough to be able to take care of them and not let any harm come to them. Of course, we put ourselves on rosters when we had them, because we'd want to go to sliding down the banks and whatever, and they'd have to stay up in the shallow beds, so someone had to stay with them. So, you know, everyone had a bit of a grouchy moment if they had to go and look after the little ones. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many creeks, and when it was raining like this, we'd go lobby hunting, you know, down the gullies. And you'd find the big lobby holes and you'd be pulling them out and you'd bring them home. You'd be covered in mud and drenched. But your parents didn't care. Hose yourself off before <laughs> you come in, you know. <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah, we just enjoyed life. And I mean, I had a secret little spot down the side of what is now known as Mary Valley Road. <laughs> and it was an outcrop of little rocks with all these ferns and stuff. And I used to take my little tiny, back then we had these little tiny dolls, baby doll things. And I used to call them my fairies and go and play on the, on the rocks with the fairies, you know, and no one would even know you were there. But my mum did, she knew, she'd walk across, which is now um, Pronger's, yard <laughs> across the road, walk across there and just look over the edge and go, oh, you're still there, all right, we'll come up for lunch soon, you know, <laughs> and then we go back. But you could trust people back then. You could trust, you can't even trust your children to go out on the front footpath these days with the amount of traffic on the road. It's amazing. It's, I'd been away for about Oh, close to 20 years. I've been teaching down in um, Brisbane and my son's not long left the nest so I've been nominated to care for mum and dad. They're in their late 80s and um, so I've come home and I'm, honestly it was quite a bit of a shock to see the... I didn't know anybody for a start and all your usual shops that you were used to weren't there. And then there was this giant estate up the road and it's getting even bigger. And it was quite a, a culture shock, really, I suppose. Oh, terribly, terribly. And that, yeah, and it's happened so, like 20 years isn't a great deal of time to have all these changes go on. And to have so many people come into the, 
township that is are just so different <laughs> you know once upon a time you knew knew everyone and you know you, everyone like even the policemen mm. back then you know to get my license I did it at Imble he sat on his porch and said all right drive down there around that statue and come back up here and do me a reverse park that's how I got my license <laughs> I can't even remember the name of the policeman, mm -hmm. but uh, probably just as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that sort of thing. And if the boys, you know, as the boys grew up and they were teenagers and that, and they, they might have got themselves in a bit of a strife, mm -hmm. instead of being rough with them or locking them up, they'd take them home to their parents and the parents would, you know, all right, you're grounded. You're not going anywhere for three weeks. And that was the worst thing to ever happen because we lived virtually out in the sticks at Jones Hill at that period. You know, that was, now I know it's only a couple of minutes drive into town, but it was the sticks. Mm. <laughs> so. Um, that was punishment. That was punishment <laughs> was enough. You're not allowed to go to the movies. You're not, because there was only, there was the Olympia Theatre. Um, the Vernardis's had that. And then they had the, um, the drive-in as well. And um, we used to, that was a, a big treat to go to the theatre. And um, I remember you'd go and see just about anything. But they had this so called scary movie on, and I didn't like it very much. I was, must have been about eight or nine. I just didn't like it at all. And it was all black and white movie, and you'd look at it today and it wouldn't be scary at all compared to what they do today. <laughs> Emma Moor was a, quite a, a popular place for us to visit. We had friends and, and um, you know, mum and dad had friends. And as we got older in the high school, we mixed more with our friends out at Mary Valley because we were old enough to. You know, but um, every year the school used to have its little gathering and not so much as they what they have fates or anything these days, but every year um, they'd have the breakup gathering and all the people from the valley would come up to the school and what we would do was um, have competitions in games and that sort of thing. Um, some of the um, farmers would bring in their little animals and we could pat them and, and play with them or they'd show us how to milk a goat or something like that. We would, um, oh, all the home cooking. You know, today when they have breakups, they have fruit platters, cheese platters, yeah. that sort of thing. But the, they used to cook, you know, even the bread. They used to cook the pies, the cakes, the tarts, all that stuff. And you just look forward to lunch, to have all that stuff that they bring along. And the, and the ribbon sandwiches and, you know, the old time, you know, on the table. And it was just, you don't see it anymore. I remember my mum getting up in the morning to make sponge cakes for the day, you know, and she'd make the sponge cakes and get the cream, well, she'd take the cream off the milk that we got from Corbett's and down the road, um, the Perkinses used to grow strawberries. So they'd bring up the strawberries and mum bring the cake, Corbett's would bring the cream and they'd put them all together and, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. And then I remember, you know, at the end of the day, end of, we'd have a little bag to go home with. You'd get a book from school. Mm. I've still got all my Enid Blyton books from school. And you'd get a, a bag of, um, who was it? Viv, Viv, he was the fruiterer. And he used to drive around in a little green ute with a canopy on the back and all his fruit and stuff was in the back and he'd pull up on the side of the road and you'd just go and buy your, your veggies and your fruit from him. Viv, I can't remember his last name, but um, he was the one that used to bring all the bags of plums and the apricots and, you know, and you'd get that. And we'd always, I thought it was so special, you'd get um, the little ice cream in the bucket and a, a packet of seal chips. Yeah, they were called seal, but I, th I don't know whether they're even made now, but 
they were little packets and we thought that was amazing because you never ever saw anything in little packets back then and you'd get that little packet of sealed chips so you know the things that were special to us back then are sort of oh that's pretty lame today <laughs> yeah, but I mean we didn't have the advancement of what they have today yeah. my kids have just ease and convenience mm -hmm. and I think that has taken a lot of uh, what should we say okay. it's taken away traditions it's taken away um, initiative mm. people don't use their initiative much anymore and it's given everyone this expectation of here and now mm. I want it I've got to have it mm. whereas we would wait for weeks yeah. to, for something to come in the mail I want, yeah. I want it tomorrow I want it now yeah. and um, we didn't have that and I think we were better people for it. Mm -hmm. We have more consideration for mm -hmm. others and other things. Mm -hmm. You so would wait and you'd do yeah. your preserves and you would make your jams and mm -hmm. all of that sort of thing. You didn't even really have a good freezer back in those days. Mm -hmm. I remember when we first got a freezer, that was amazing. <gasps> we can keep ice cream in it. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Um, I was on the, on the uh, what should we say, the opposing side. <laughs> I didn't want the dam. Um, it wasn't, I mean, the logical thing was look at the land, look where you want to put this dam, it's not going to be deep enough. And everyone could see that. I was really upset about how all those long-term people who had been in that country for generations had been taken off their land and not even given enough to get a decent home somewhere else and then the land was sold off to other people they weren't even offered it back that was really disgusting I thought that, that shows me that the government has no real consideration for anyone especially long like the the history, the people who made the history, the people who made this town, mm. who made everything around this town for other people to be able to be here today. Mm. I don't know how many people think about that these days. Mm. Well. It did, and as everything else. I see Gympie seems to be the, like the little hole tucked away, and then all of a sudden someone in government or business or whatever will go, oh, we can get that for that and we'll use that, but they don't consult the people. It's the same as the water drilling down at Traveston, down that way, um, the Traveston, the township, mm -hmm. how they, that person was allowed to drill and siphon out all of that water, and that made the rest of the township suffer. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, he didn't really get in any repercussion on that. And all I see is that it's run through governments who have no ideals of real life people and real life townships. Um, we're always overlooked in Gympie for biz, um, all the government agencies, majority of them. Um, I work out of, I'd, I'd love to work in Gympie, mm -hmm. but I work out of Gympie because the agencies are outside of Gympie. So that's where I have to work. And these are all the points that I had put mm. forward. There is no research done. You have not consulted the indigenous peoples of the land. Um, there is sacred areas here that you need to take into consideration. The argument I put forth with that was, oh, so you've got a heritage building there that you cannot alter or change in any form because it is heritage. Just because this is a plot of land it has heritage, it has significant heritage. And like there were, there are areas there where there were significant camping areas for indigenous peoples. So they didn't even look at that. And this is the trouble with big business and government today. They look at the money situation and what they can reap out of that. And they say that it's, oh, well, we're going to employ more people nothing came out of it even with the main roads that are going through with the the new 
um, highway, how many people working on that are actually people from this area? You know, they, they could support this area by employing more people. And there are people who have the engineering degrees. There are people who have road work degrees or whatever they need to work in that area. Mm. I know of maybe just a small handful of people who are working on mm. areas in that um, highway. Mm. But as far as I'm concerned, they need to employ, as they go along, mm. the people of the township they're going through. Help them out a bit. You're destroying their country. Mm. That was our dairy hub. Mm. Gympie supplied Queensland with a, um, a dairy. You know, that was... And our pineapples and all that other stuff. Mm. Um, but all those dairy pastures were considered able to be drowned. And all that would have been like... Uh, I actually stayed um, out at Emma Moore um, last year. I, my daughter came up from Threadbow, so we hired a house, you know, those B&Bs, um, and it belonged to, um, not Tremackies, um, oh, Hull's Apples. And we got talking about the land and that, and the house was up on a hill, but if the dam had gone through, all of that uh, down below them where they had their dairy cattle would have been flooded and they would have had no land. They, lo they would have lost hundreds and hundreds of acres, if not thousands of acres. And that's just one family. So you've, I don't know how many families were displaced. Well, they'd already oh, taken their land. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine you've spent your life on farming property, farming, and then the government comes along and says, oh, we want that land and we're only going to give you pittance for it. Yeah. And you're put in a small home on a small block of land. Mm. Could you imagine the stress, the, the, the adjustment that, mm. that those people would have had to make? They should have never taken the land off those people mm. until they had done all their research and sorted all that out. They should never have bought up that land. They did, and that was wrong. And that was Anna Bly. I do not care for that person, and I don't care for Mr. Campbell Newman, mm. who's closed all the South, all schools in Queensland. Mm. And, you know, like things like that, that affects country towns oh, immensely. Yeah. It's not fair on, they don't, what should I say? They don't consider the impact of yeah. their ideals. Yeah. Yeah. They're sitting in an office in a city. Yeah. They've probably never been in a countryside, yeah. never had to know the, the workings of living in a countryside. Mm -hmm. And they're going, oh, yeah, we're looking at figures and facts and yeah. this will work and that will work, but you're dealing with human content. So that alone is something that needs to be addressed with governments. Well, see, this is why when um, the new council came in here, yeah. um, I, my brother and I made a point of asking for a meeting with them all so that we could get to know them yeah. and discuss, you know, yeah. what is going on before they get their ideals onto new things. Yeah. And that meant part of... Um, Emma Moore, we wanted to discuss the preservation of Emma Moore areas, the forestry areas and all that. We work in with HQP, so um, that with that combination of Indigenous and, and plantations, we were hoping that we can work together and, and develop more recognition of the area, uh, more advancement in the cultivation of the area, not the building of the area, but the cultivation of the area. And like my brother is, um, he's, they call him the macadamia man. He, he is, has an interest in the, in the macadamia. It's originated here, even the ones over in Hawaii. And do you know where that tree is? All the nuts that went to Hawaii 
to grow, cultivate, that tree that they got them off is still in existence. It is in a paddock right at the back of Upper Kandanga. It is the only tree in this cow paddock and it's just this big old stumpy tree and it's still there. And that's all where all the Hawaiian nuts that they claimed were theirs came from. That tree. That tree. My brother, um, he, he researches all like from the original gimpy nut, which is a tiny and it's actually poisonous. And that he's found out Cedar, Cedar Pocket way. There's an original stand of gimpy nuts out that way. But then he's also looked at how it's flowed down and, and mixed with another nut and developed the rough nut. And then they, oh, there's all there's different types. That's, that's his thing. That's his specialty. <laughs> My thing is micro plants, micro, like the natives. Yeah. Um, <coughs> We are uh, on our way out to Mary's Creek on Sunday. Um, I'm taking a group of ladies. That is the sacred women's area out there. It's birthing grounds for the Gubby Gubby people. And um, we're cleaning it up and making it back into a women's area. Wow. We have a women's circle that That's we all get together and we'll go and do that on a weekend. And anybody is welcome to come along. Wow. <laughs> but we also have this women's circle so that um, as we said, there's all these new people down in the valley and that. Mm. And they don't know everything. They don't know anyone. So we started this, Carly O'Donnell, she was working with Gympie Volunteers. Um, her and I got together and got this women's circle going that we meet on a Sunday, the last Sunday of the month in the park and do all our, like everyone gets to know. We've had people from overseas, New South Wales, wow. Western Australia, and we all get together and, you know, and then the, the original people from here that yeah. um, grew up here, we, you know, it's great because we can do this, yeah. talk about our history, and then oh. they get a more, a bigger picture yeah. of what um, Gympie's about. Wow. That's our stamping grounds. We would walk down from Jones Hill, and you'd go down through um, Macintosh Creek and you, you know, that road that goes up, what is that, Fitzpatrick Road. It yeah. used to be dirt. I don't know whether it's still dirt up there, but it was like always it. dirt yeah. up around that way. And we'd walk up to the top of the dawn that way because it was easier and safer to walk up around that way than straight down and up the main road. So, because over on the corner, you know, the the house on the corner as you get to the top of, I can't, is that Dawn Road? Off the Mary Valley Road? When you get to the top of Dawn Road, on your left, there's a house there. In the corner of that yard, there used to be a big um, cage and it had a wedge tail eagle in it. And we've always felt so sad for it because it was, it never got out of the cage. It was, the cage would have been, oh, five foot tall by about five foot square or something but this wedgetail eagle was always in that cage no i think they'd had it from a baby they'd got it out of a nest or something I don't, i'm not sure but um, that was the cullens place there so we'd go up there and because all around those roads there was raspberries and all manner of fruit and stuff growing around there with you know the old peach trees um the plum trees, you'd go along and you'd have a feed the whole time. You wouldn't go bother going home all day and your parents wouldn't care because you didn't, they knew that you'd eat. And we'd always take our fishing lines with us and catch the perch out of the creek and, you know, have light the little fire, because we were allowed to back then, light the little fire and, because and, mum showed us how to, um, you wrap the fish in mud. You catch it and you wrap it all in mud. And that way you don't have to skin it, um, scale it or, or clean it. And then you put it in your coals in the fire and that the mud, when the mud dried, you bring, brought it back out, and tapped the mud and broke it off and all the scales would come off with the mud and the, the gut would curl up in a little ball. So you just got fish. And so we'd eat that along with the raspberries or, or you know, anything else that was grown or maybe 
um, uh, old Doc Kenny. He was the um, one of the fathers up at the um, I one of the priests up at the Catholic school here, and um, he had a property over. It's still there, and I don't know whether it's still got the White House with the big red roof up on the hill as you drive down you can see there's a house over oh, Sullivan's are over on this side of the creek and they're up on that yeah. side of the creek and that was Doc Kenny's house and he would grow things like tomatoes and cucumbers and that and then, oh can we get a cucumber off you Doc yeah all right well, you get that you know fish yeah salad fish whatever else you know so. you didn't have to worry about things and people wouldn't care you know they'd invite you into Nothing for us as kids to go and um, sit at the table of a couple of old farmers and they'd bring out the cake and bickies and we'd have a cup of tea with them and have a bit of a chat and then be on our way. You know, you just wander the neighbourhood and people would just say, what are you doing? Does your mother know you? Yeah, she knows. We got this one, the little one, you know. And um, they would just say, oh, well, have you had lunch yet? Oh, not yet. Well, come on. So you'd go in and have lunch with them. So these were just people in the neighbourhood. Yep. These days, you wouldn't even know who's in your neighbourhood. And parents knew their kids were safe. Yep. You know, today, I couldn't even let my kids go out the front step. Yeah, Jones Hill has Jones just Hill surprised yeah. me so much considering that there was, I think there was 12 kids left in the school. And then all of a sudden, there were more. <laughs> well, see, um, people started selling land up out that way. Mm, and right. they opened up Waldock Road, mm. um, which was always a lane. Mm. So that's when more people started needing a school there. Yep. Imagine if that school had a closed town. And this is why I get cranky with Campbell Newman, because he didn't even look into the positions of those schools mm. and why they were there. Mm. And he forced children to travel hours mm. to go to school mm. simply because he wanted to save that money. Mm. And it, I don't think schools should never be touched. No. They should never be touched. The education is the best yeah. thing that life can ever bring you. Oh. I would not let my children ride on the bus it was my just my weird thing um until they were old enough to know their whereabouts and everything you know i've seen little tiny ones go on buses and i just freak out you know just speaking of the buses i mean there was they, there was mr deneen there was my favorite bus driver was mr jones and he drove a little green bus with a silver top and I sat right behind him and we used to sing songs and he'd come from down the Mary Valley and drive up and pick us all up at the Jones Hill School. This is when mum had had enough of that teacher and decided we were going to Southside. So we'd pick us up there and we'd all go over to Southside. But you know, every year he would give us, you know, even though we weren't getting it from the school, but he'd bring along a little brown bag with some stone fruit in it for us at the end of the year and he'd give us that. And I thought he was such a fantastic man. I, I made him a cushion cover. I, I embroidered it all for him and he kept it in his bus and, you know, he looked after us very well. And, um, yeah, bus drivers back then were great. Well, the Lewises. Well, you know, when you jumped on the bus for, for the Lewises, you'd sit up on their motor and I remember singing, he'd be there driving along and he'd be singing a song like um, something about a choo-choo peanut butter. It was about a, a peanut fell on the railway track, train came along and that was that and choo-choo peanut butter and it squashed the peanut. <laughs> and this was the song that we'd sing all the way you know, from town or from home to town or whatever. And, you know, you, you, everyone knew the bus driver. Yeah. And they were fantastic. Mm. Mr Gormley, Mr Deneen, Mr... Who was the other fellow? Dunning? 
could have been a Dunning, I think. But they were all a different people, yeah. you know, back then. You go back to when you started school and you're sitting in a row mm. and you're looking at a board and there's teachers up there going, oh, this, and this, and this, and this. And, and well, you drift off you because do. you don't understand that's too far away for you to connect with and they're not connecting with that and so you lose it, you know. I ended up, when I was little, we had, we always had a fireplace, but this was a stove in the kitchen and for some reason, back in the day when people really didn't think about safety, um, there was a stool behind the stove, but there was a clothesline also hanging behind the stove. And cause I got up there and I was swinging on that clothesline and the clothesline broke. So I wrapped myself around the chimney. I got burns and whatever all over me and um, ended up in hospital. <coughs> then ended up with measles on top of the third degree burns <laughs> and all this. So I was spent quite a bit of time in hospital and missed out on quite a bit of education. So that, and then when I got back to school, well, I've got no fingerprints on my hands and this hand I couldn't use. So I was using my left hand, but every time I picked up the pen or the pencil with, no, it wasn't, it was the, the slate and the slate pencil. Every time I picked it up in my left hand, they used to have this ruler that was about that long and about, oh, that wide. And it had come down on my knuckles. This is how education was back then, you know? Oh, you can't use your left hand. Use your right hand. I can't. <laughs> so, you know, out of doing that, that caused dyslexia. And this is what they're only just finding out these days is the situations that people were put in through education back then has caused a lot of issues with their mental function. <laughs> so this is why all these other things are put in place for children today to be able to function and absorb the education yeah. without stress, yeah. Yeah. you know, and because they get enough stress at home, majority oh. of these children, yeah. and um, they don't need it at school. Yeah. They're just there to learn. Yeah. And it should be a, a familiar place, a friendly place, yeah. and a comfortable place for children to be and learn. And you will find that they will learn so much better. Yeah. My youngest, we were in China when he was a baby. Oh, wow. And um, over there, their daycare systems are not a daycare system unless they have music, music theory on several instruments. Um, language, they, um, he could speak three different languages by the time he was five. Um, and his, his English and math, even though we were in China, was at a level five rather than starting at prep, you know? Wow. So he was a bit better in, in grasping the education. And it's because they do start when they're so young. And that's what I do with my kids. I start them young. When you look at our cultural history, we've, we've taught our children from day dot what they're doing, you know, even to their toileting abilities or their survival abilities. We want to know that that child of two years old knows how to pick out that food there and eat it. We want to know that that child of two years old is able to drink that water, know that that's okay to drink and that's going to help with their survival and that's all part of the cultural system of how to, how to raise your children the Chinese have a similar idea or probably a more advanced idea than what we had but that's how we think and why I took on the education in the first place and then I was invited to write the curriculum so um, then that made it so much better because I could put what I wanted in that yeah. curriculum and know that it was going to work and be right so that's and I've watched it over the last five years. It's only been in the system for about five years, I think. 
and because I started writing in 2010 mm -hmm. and we didn't finish till about 2014 mm -hmm. I think it is good and to see kids come out with stuff that I've done oh I put that in place. Yeah. Woo! -woo. <laughs> My main aim of life today is to, I'm a community person, mm -hmm. and to just let people of our community, whether they be originals or newcomers or whatever, know about us, know about our community, know about all the little nooks and crannies of what we do, you know? Like I'm only, I only do a small part of it and I barely, barely scratch the surface with things but I make sure that the council knows. Mm. I make sure that the council knows that um, this needs to be done or, you know, can we do this mm. to enhance the knowledge of our people here? Mm -hmm. So this is what we've been doing. Like we've just had the, the art in the museum that um, the walk yes. was great, you know, and then um, to bring in the Indigenous servicemen, yeah. I missed that. I had to do, I was working in Brisbane oh. at that stage. Not just for the Indigenous. Like a few years ago, I was quite disappointed with, um, they had a thing at the Civic Centre, it was a, um, I can't exactly remember, but it was something to do with, you know, the, the building of Gimby and that sort of stuff, and it was a, it was a dinner. Mm. My mum and my auntie did a smoking ceremony there, mm. but my disappointment in it was I looked at who was there. I didn't actually go and photographs and stuff, mm. and it was all newcomers to Gimby. And I was quite upset the fact that they'd put the price, yeah, because they have to price a meal and whatever, the night, the function. But I thought they could have done a little leeway or put in some special invitations to those people who actually built the foundations or were around when the foundations were building. Like, Simmons. Um, there's there's lots of carpenters, there's lots of um, people who had businesses and yeah. stuff like that yeah. around the area and those people were not present at that, yeah. that dinner, you know? And the fact that they didn't even invite the husbands of my mother and auntie yeah. to attend, you know, not that I'm whether dad would have gone or not, but, you know, it was Pretty just the principle of yeah. it or... I spoke to, he used to be with the paper, the newspaper, but he was, um, I think he's now a counsellor or something. Um, anyway, he was one of the people that was organising it and I, I spoke with him and I just said, well, it was quite disappointing in the mm -hmm. fact that you didn't acknowledge the traditional people, the, the people who actually put the blood, sweat and tears into yeah. building this community. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge all those people because, I mean, it was just, we wouldn't have had any, anything if those people didn't put their backbone into the, mm. into the community and, and help it. Yeah. Yeah. Even like the old man McVanagas, you know, he was there for years. Yeah. Our part of the Mary River was, say, McIntosh Creek, and it flowed into the Mary River. So we'd follow that all the way down to the river. And then we'd follow the, we had canoes and stuff that what we made and we'd get in them, you know, and go down. And we had no fear. But we'd go down towards the pumping station. And because we knew across the, the river from the pumping station, you'd find the little turtles. And it was the little black and orange turtles and all those. They're all very rare these days. Yeah. And you'd go down there and you'd find them and um, you'd pick up the mussels. Because if you cleaned the mussels out, they weren't too bad to eat. Mm -hmm. So you washed them out with, um, you put um, lukewarm water with salt 
and they'd spit all their insides out so you could eat them then. <laughs> but we do that. All down the side of the pumping station, like those big boulders. Yes, we were responsible for throwing a few of those boulders down the hill into the river. And they're probably still there. And all the um, oh, raspberries, the guavas. Um, what else was up there? There was... Oh, we had our, had our kumquats and our mandarins up there as well. So you'd all be up around the... And that was before they'd even had a fence around that that um, water tank. So, um, can you imagine how dangerous that was? Because that tank, not only did it, it was deep, but it had suction at the bottom of it for the water to flow into town. So if you fell in it, you could be gone. So these are the sort of things that we would, our parents didn't actually know we were doing. But we came home safe every day. <laughs> and it wasn't just our family. I mean, again, it was the Grahams and the Leroids and, you know, the, the, there was um, the Dokes. Yeah, all the kids up the road. We'd all, there'd be a pile of us and we'd be, it'd be like a, I don't know, you'd, you'd see them because of how big the group was. That's what I find is missing today. We'd either go down to the weir at, at Air, down the bottom of Aries pa um, property, which is now going around the bottom of Ashalon, that creek, and the weir there. We would go down there, or we would go down to McIntosh Creek, because there was a swimming hole down there um, on Doc Kenny's property. <laughs> so the thing was, you knew everybody, they all knew you, and there was none of this, what are you doing on my land? sort of thing and they knew that you weren't there to harm or destroy anything you're just there to explore yeah and that's what we did yeah. we just explored we knew every nook and cranny the mines over the back of um jones hill there uh, yep. there's a mine sh there's mines over there there is a shaft where we used to walk into didn't care you know, didn't think about maybe it'd fall in on you or something but you'd walk along and you'd feel the walls and in the walls were the holes drilled where they put the candles. And because you'd feel it because there's wax dripping down the walls and you'd, it's still there, but we won't tell people where it is exactly. But um, yeah, you know, things like that. The fears were not there and we weren't, um, what would we call, we weren't satellite children where we've got the parent hovering over the top of us all the time. We very rarely had parents <laughs> near us, but we never did anything dangerous or wrong. And because we knew back then you'd get a flogging. We had a switchy stick that used to get whacked across the back of your leg. <laughs> Mind you, I never got hit because I was daddy's girl. <sighs> I was just daddy's girl. I was, just, I was the baby, oh, well, not, not the baby. I was smack dab in the middle of the family, but I was the youngest girl. Yep. So, you know, I'd climb all over dad and whatever, and he'd let me get away with blue murder. <laughs> once, once, only once, he'd had to, mum had been calling us and calling us, and we were up at the Leroids, and we didn't come down, and then dad went up and get up all these kids, and I thought, oh, well, I'll just go down the roadway and run down and be in there, wash my hands and get ready for, for dinner. And all the other kids had come in. They didn't wash their hands, they just sat at the table. And um, I walked out of the bathroom and Dad was standing at the door and he went whack, just tapped me on the back of my leg and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> because my father had smacked me. <laughs> it was horrible. And made it worse because all the others laughed. So I was, I was in the foulest of moods that night. <laughs> Most of my, my area would have been as far as Long Flat Lagoon Pocket, that dawn, and then uh, we, we never really ventured much past Cox Road, which goes up to Groundwater Road, that creek down there. Um, we never really ventured much. Did you know that there were borer rings at the back of Sullivan's? You know the Cox Road and you got 
or you got the bridge, yeah. then that was Sullivan's house up. Because yeah. so, Sullivan's had a few properties around the place. That was the old so, old people Sullivan. They had that house. But up the back of their property behind the shed was a borer ring. And down um, at the back of, you know, you go down to Waldock and what's yeah. what do they call that road behind the school now? Yeah, um, it was named after a teacher or somebody. Yeah, anyway, at the back of there, where they join across in the paddock um, was another big bore ring there, but that got all ploughed up and everything. You know that there's three houses have been destroyed on that property because they've done that to that bore ring? Well, that's my opinion. People have passed away wow. in serious situations on that property. Really? Yep. Oh and I do believe it's because they destroyed the boiler, boiler room. Mm. So, and, and nothing will grow there. So yeah, you have a look. You look at the animals on there, they're, they're very Poor. poorly, and the plants won't grow. Mm. So, but I think the one up behind Sullivan's may still be in existence. It might be a bit overgrown and worn and that, but I think that one is still in existence. Oh. They were documented with um, Queensland Archives. I documented them probably about 25 years ago or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that area there was a meeting area for yeah. the Gubby people. Yeah. A certain clan, you know, they're all in different like Gubby is just the nation yep. and then within the nation there's family groups yep. so um, yeah that was a meeting area mm. and that and gathering and eating area mm. there as well so Jones Hill area has been used quite significantly mm. over the centuries well all that area there Jones Hill Lagoon Pocket that was um, I'd say from looking at the amount of, of rings and what I've found out that way, I'd say it was more than just a family meeting area. I'd say it would be a clans meeting area where several different clans may have come together. That dam, that area, that lagoon, would have been fished and cultivated. Yep all of that area. It's the same as over, um, what is that area over there? Over behind, um, well you've got Nolans and then that road that goes up the back, up that way. There's another lag other lagoons oh, up there, yes, yes, yes. over towards Cedar Pocket Way, yeah. but not quite as far. Um, it's actually, um, have you ever heard of Muller's Hole? Now we're talking about the other side of town, okay. towards we'll Tinkham Bay. Yeah. Um, there's, um, as you're coming into White's, is that White's Bridge? Yeah. yeah. Just before White's Bridge there's a road you turn off. Yeah. And years and years ago, my parents said that that's where they used to take, go as teenagers to go swimming in this Muller's Hole. Oh. Um, did you know, you know the road, Ascot Road? Uh, it's the road that's now being used as a side track to go around the highway there from Olgamburian Road. Well, you know, um, yeah. you go down past the high school, yep. you get just past the the highway, new highway thing, yep. and then you have to, oh, you can go keep going to Tinkan that way, but if you're coming down oh, past yeah. the Victory, okay you have to turn off and go back around that yeah. way because that end of the road's closed up. Yeah. Well, that road that you go up is Ascot Road Ascot. and apparently that was Lover's Lane. Mm. According to my parents and a few other parents that age. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, the Buckleys used to tell us. And, the, and um, also they used to go out to... Um, What's that crossing out here? Widgee. Widgee crossing. 
Widgee Crossing was another area. Isn't that river significant? Always Look where it flows and how many people it touches and you know, our memories. I wish they would stop the four wheel driving yeah. because they are really wrecking the place out there. I haven't been out to Traveston Crossing lately because no, it's not on a, on a main road anymore no. and they had to go off it. Yeah. And that's, and uh, what makes people think that it's okay to leave their rubbish? Oh. To, to desecrate a place. So I haven't been there f probably for 20 years. They bring it there, why can't they take it away? And, and see, this is all part of this generation that today's is a throwaway generation. So let's just throw everything away and, dis and don't worry about the environment or anything like that. And then when it all falls in on you, let's complain. So this is where I work hard to try and get people to acknowledge the fact that you only leave your footprints. You only leave your footprints. You do not leave anything else there because that wasn't used to it. What if someone come and left that in your place? They're ignorant. They're ignorant and disrespecting people. They do not, well, I really wouldn't want to see their own home because they, if they treat others, other people's stuff like that or other things then they can't be too interested in their own survival you know it's sad and to see that area down there to get wrecked it's so sad and this is another off shot of take those farmers off that land and see what happens people take advantage at least the farmers were keeping it to an, a point, you know, they weren't dropping their McDonald's or whatever. I actually get quite cranky with those takeaway places mm -hmm. and I will and have done, sorry, picked up the rubbish and gone and put it back on their counter. Yeah. Because, I mean, you go down to the sands mm -hmm. and there's always somebody who has to leave rubbish. that sort of rubbish. And it's not biodegradable, no. so it won't go down. Yeah, it'll, and like that river goes straight out to the sea, yeah. but look at all the animals and things that it's got to pass by before yeah. it gets there. Yeah. It's sad, and it's it's. I'm I'm a big stickler for maybe somebody should be starting to actually find all these litter bugs and do something that is going to affect them because that's why they're doing it. They're not being affected and so they can do whatever they like and leave that rubbish or that dirty nappy, oh, disgusting, you know, that sort of thing is just left. Bottles, plastic bottles. And then they break bottles. Yeah. Why? Oh. <laughs> that's silly. <laughs> And it, like, they ruin the whole of the Mary Valley by doing things like that because yeah. that gets into the water. It flows through down further. And you may think that it's a beautiful place at the moment, but you're not going to keep it that way for long. Yeah. So yeah. if anything, if I can do anything in my life, it's to help hopefully teach people to respect the country and know what it's there for. It's there for your survival. No, you know, we've got to live alongside and in harmony. We can't keep overpowering things and stepping on things. It's not fair to the rest of the world or the country or land. Right. The one thing I wanted to mention was this person yeah. who had been part of building the dam, the um, Barumba Dam, and the Normandy Bridge, Blue Burton, <laughs> I don't know his real name, Dad only knew him as, a, as Blue Burton, and he lived in Dagen. He was in the Light Horse Brigade, um, and he worked on Barumba Dam and Normandy Bridge, and he was in the forestry as a labourer. And the little story that goes with Normandy Bridge is they took a little bit of extra time to build that bridge. Yeah. And that's because the workers had found a seam 
of gold that came across the from the other side of the river across and as it got to the bank on the other side it rose higher in the like easier to, to access and apparently there was a little crevice like this and all the gold had filled up in there and they were scraping it out and this was taking them extra time and, it, and, and at other times the boss would say, oh geez, you're here early, you're ready to start early and they'd be down there scraping out the gold. So that's why Normandy Bridge took a little extra time to build. <laughs> I'd say it's the current bridge because they knocked that wooden bridge down, it was a lot lower. And it's the current bridge, the pylons, the yeah. concrete pylons actually go into a seam there. Yeah. Oh, he was good mates. Good mate. That was yeah. Dad's good mate. Yeah. And um, Dad moved away for a number of years. They moved up to Keppel, um, up near Rockhampton. And um, in that time, he lost contact and with friends and things yeah. down this way. And of course, they were older people, so they've yeah. obviously passed. Yeah. And he may have had some in Aboriginality in him or Islander or something like that because his father was a, a sailor, American sailor. Oh. So Dad says he's from America, it was in America at the time of war when he, his mother had him and his father was from America. So he was a, a quite a big man, apparently. <laughs> I thought that was quite Still cheeky of them. <laughs> well, they did. Of course. Yeah, because back in those days, you couldn't tell exactly. They hadn't worked out exactly where gold came, like that particular strain of gold. These days, they can pick it up like that and say, oh, that's come from such and such an area or wherever, you know. Well, Dad and I still, still go Foster King. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, um, yeah, we've had a little little luck on Plus most things but yeah. it's more the adventure with dad than yeah. than getting the gold I think because <laughs> yeah. my dad tells some fantastic stories so oh.